Gamers, before you ask, yes, I've seen the leaked Elden Ring footage, and no, I won't be showing it to you. You know why? Because Bandai Namco will probably yeet my channel from the internet if I was to ever try and move with that much moxie. The New York Times has a motto, all the news that's fit to print. Well, my motto is, all the news that won't get my channel deleted. So as much as I would love, love, love to show you that freshly minted Elden Ring gameplay footage, I'm going to direct you to Jeff Grubb's Twitter feed and go on my merry way. By the way, we will come back to Elden Ring later in this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to This Week in Video Games, the show that brings you the freshest week old gaming news, distilled into a slick 20-ish minute digest that you can have on in the background while you do more important things, like cut down trees in New World, or cut down trees in Minecraft, or cut down trees in Valheim, or cut down trees, IRL. Hope you got council approval for that, mate. It's been another interesting week of news and releases, some of it good, some of it bad, and thankfully, some of it a little cringe. So let's get straight into it, shall we? Why don't we start with that cringe, eh? Get the old juices flowing. This week, Genshin Impact developer MiHoYo had a moment and everyone was like, MiHoYo, what the fuck are you guys doing? Their official Twitter account tweeted out a promotion that was meant to inspire the proletariat into uncompensated social media labor. We were to follow some new Twitter account they made called at Pyman to the moon. And if we peons pumped their socials hard enough and got the account to 1 million followers, Mihoyo would reward us by asking a billionaire to play their game so we could watch the billionaire play their game. And then we could all be like, look everyone, a billionaire plays this game now. And that was apparently meant to mean something and motivate people, I guess. The billionaire was of course Elon Musk, but the truly baffling thing about this promotion is that Mihoyo never even cleared this with Musk before it went out. It was just based on the fact that there's an NP in the game called Ella Musk. So Mihoyo's social media manager seemed to have this marvelous stroke of cringe spiration and just went with it before asking one important question. Why the fuck would anyone care if Elon Musk played Genshin Impact? By the way, I am trademarking Crinspiration. I just made that shit up right then and that is too good to let other people get hold of. Anyway, the whole thing was a disaster. Within hours of the announcement, the tweet had over 20,000 quote retweets, which can be a good sign sometimes, but was not a good sign this time, as the ratio gods were well and truly not in Mihoyo's favor. The tweet was quickly deleted with no follow-up explanation, so they're really just out there trying to pretend that this thing never happened, but it did, and in the years to come when we're all living in one of Elon's Mars colonies, we can look back on this video and remember a time when we were still allowed to make fun of Elon Musk without our shock collars going off. Speaking of spivvy bullshit, Valve just banned NFTs on Steam. If you don't know what an NFT is, lucky you. I wish I could go back to that time. But the long and the short of it is that NFTs are essentially a digital proof of ownership. So while lots of people can right click, copy paste this ugly looking JPEG, I'm the smart guy because I'm the only one who paid $17 million for the digital certificate that says I own it. And I'm not messing with you here, by the way. Someone actually paid $17 million for this. Whether you like it or not, and I do not, NFTs are going to be a massive force in video games in the future because they set up the foundation for what's known as a play to earn economy, where games become proxy financial ecosystems that allow people to earn and trade items that have real world value by virtue of the blockchain. The problem is that all of this is a regulatory nightmare right now. It's the wild west out there and a disproportionate number of operators in this space are just scammers looking to flip a quick buck out of the confused fear of missing out. Valve are looking to get ahead of this mess, updating their guidelines to make explicit that they won't permit any games that use blockchain technology or allow their users to trade cryptocurrencies or NFTs. This created a vacuum that was very quickly filled by Epic Games when CEO Tim Sweeney tweeted out that Epic would welcome games built on blockchain tech so long as it quote, follow the relevant laws, disclose their terms, and are age rated by an appropriate group, end quote. People very quickly pointed back to a tweet from Tim not one month earlier, where he explicitly states that Epic aren't touching NFTs as quote, the whole field is currently tangled up with an intractable mix of scams, interesting decentralized tech foundations, and scams, end quote. That's one hell of a turnaround in a month, but I guess Epic can't be too picky about what they welcome onto their storefront when the Epic Game Store is losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Remember how the recent Nintendo Direct snuck in that cheeky Nintendo Online upgrade thing, allowing you to play a handful of Nintendo 64 and Sega Genesis games and we were all really excited? Well, the bill came, and now we're a lot less excited. Nintendo's new online expansion pack is roughly two and a half times more expensive than the base subscription offering. Two and a half times! That's worse than when Microsoft tried to double the cost of Xbox Live before quickly backtracking and being like, 
we really missed the mark with this announcement. To be fair, Nintendo's offering does include an upcoming Animal Crossing DLC, which on its own is worth around 25 US dollars, but like, not everyone wants that. Why not remove that from the membership offering and let us pay like five or 10 bucks a year so we can play a few Nintendo 64 games and not feel like we're getting ripped off? This is a real Tom Nook move right here, Nintendo. Sticking with Nintendo, let's talk about Metroid Dread. First up, Dread is a smash hit worldwide, but it turns out that Samus is also big in Japan. This week, the Japanese sales for the game came in and Metroid Dread was the highest selling game of the week with over 86,000 units shipped. In its first three days on sale, Dread outsold the lifetime sales of a number of previous Metroid titles. This is more interesting news than you might suspect because Metroid has traditionally never really been popular in Japan. It was something that Nintendo made for the West. To see this title getting the recognition and popularity it deserves in Nintendo's homeland is nice. What's not nice is the fact that not everyone who worked on the development of Metroid Dread was credited for doing so in the game's closing credits. A report from Spanish language publication Vandal highlighted the complaints of three developers who worked on the title for varying periods, but who didn't appear in the game's credits. Developer Mercury Steam responded saying that they have a policy that you only get credited for a game if you've worked for 25% of its development time, without specifying that this was the reason why these three people were excluded from the game's credits. The story reopened that much debated topic of video game crediting, with some believing that time gaining protects the contributions of long-term committed team members, while others argue that anyone who contributes to a game at any point should be given credit. Personally, yeah, I think if you do something on a game, you should get credit for it. I don't understand why that's controversial as a viewpoint, but I have seen many devs argue passionately against this perspective, so maybe there's an angle I'm missing. By the way, did you guys see that Kotaku article where they were like, hey, Samus would be a much cooler character if she just smiled a little more. Man, the quote retweets on that one were particularly delicious. Metroid Dread isn't the only thing kicking ass in Japan right now. Turns out that Xbox is doing pretty well for itself as well, for pretty much the first time ever. Historically, the Xbox has been incapable of gaining a foothold into the Japanese market, with Japanese gamers overwhelmingly preferring a PlayStation under their TV and a Nintendo handheld in their pocket. The tide may be turning though, as this week Xbox announced that the Xbox Series consoles had sold a combined 100,000 units in Japan since launch. Compare this to the sale of the Xbox One, which took four and a half years to reach the same number of units sold. The encouraging figures are no doubt vindication for Phil Spencer, who made a very strong push into Japan, negotiating hard to see beloved JRPGs and action games like Yakuza brought to Microsoft's black and white boxes. Personally, I love to see this. The idea that both console manufacturers will be fighting hard to win the affection of Japanese gamers is only going to result in a better product for everyone involved. Congrats, Phil. Keep it up, mate. Don't worry, Sony ponies. I've got some sales data for you too. I wasn't going to leave you out. Here it is. Ready? Did you know that the Nintendo Switch has been the fastest selling console in the US every single damn month for the past 33 months? Well, if you didn't, you do now. And guess what? This month, that astonishing run was broken when the PS5 snapped the top spot, becoming the highest selling console in the US by both units and dollars. This figure is a fantastic win for Sony, who still continue to hold the top spot while we wait for their biggest exclusives, stuff like Horizon Forbidden West and God of War Ragnarok. Even in absence of those system sellers, Sony are still crushing it. The stunning success of the Switch, the foothold that the Xbox is gaining in Japan, and the sterling PS5 sales are a reminder that a rising tide lifts all boats, and platform success isn't a zero-sum game. If you were one of the lucky people who got your hands on a brand spanking new PS5 but wanted to change the faceplates, you're kind of out of luck on that one, sort of. Faceplate manufacturer D-Brand decided it would be a good idea to make PlayStation 5 faceplates that are almost indistinguishable from Sony's design, both in terms of their overall shape, but also in their use of tiny symbols etched into the inside of each plate, which in the case of the original product are in fact tiny triangles, circles, squares, and crosses. D-Brand displayed reckless braggadashery as they did all of this, constantly taunting Sony to sue them in various marketing materials. So Sony were like, okay, we will. Sony brought suit against D-Brand and are now seeking damages that could total tens of millions of dollars. D-Brand are displaying much less bravado in this moment, removing the offending faceplates from sale. Still, they did put up a 1600 word post that very strongly and very colorfully condemned Sony's lawsuit, so there's still some fight in them yet. Just as we finalize this video, D-Brand unveiled new faceplates that are quite different in their design to the previous ones. Let's see if Sony lets them get away with these. 
This week, the DC Fandom event happened where comic and pop culture nerds all congregated to be like, do you think the MCU is overrated? And they'd be in the only room in the world where everyone would be like, yeah, man, totally. There were plenty of reveals during the show. Robert Pattinson's Batman got a new trailer, as did John Cena's Peacemaker. For we gamers, though, our cup raneth over. We got a nice new trailer for Warner Brothers Gotham Knights. Here's a look at it. Not a whispered word is said. The Court of Owls is a myth. <laughs> They're listening. And we also got a new trailer for Rocksteady's upcoming Suicide Squad game. Here's some of that. The penguin is in flight. Then let's clip his wings. Oh my god! He's getting up! Hitting him again. He ran out the door! Somebody stop him! <laughs> Did that get him? <laughs> No! Both of these trailers look superb. Marvel really hasn't delivered many great games to capitalize on the success of the MCU. <coughs> Avengers. <coughs> so it's nice to see DC stepping up to fill the gap. These trailers both have plenty more to show off, so I'd recommend checking them out. If you haven't, I'll leave a link to them below. And finally, we did get a tiny piece of Dragon Age 4 news this week. It was confirmed that the game will not be releasing on last gen consoles. That is good news, but the game's still a long, long way from release. It would have been disappointing to learn that a title like that was being held back by last-gen hardware. It's not, though. It's coming to Xbox Series consoles, PS5, PC, and whatever consoles Soldier Boy releases next. It's, it's genuinely hard to keep up with them all at this point. So, what got announced or delayed this week? Well, the day before resurfaced after its long, mysterious hiatus to reveal a new gameplay trailer and a PC release date June 21st next year. This game comes from a small-time developer who have never produced anything close to this level of scale or graphical fidelity, and yet this trailer shows off a game with cutting-edge next-gen visuals, spectacularly designed open worlds, impressive-looking lighting, solid gunplay, detailed weapon customization, a social hub to share with other players, a log cabin that you can fully customize, and maybe even drivable vehicles. When people first saw this, everyone was like, red alert, this is a scam, man, this can't be real. Having seen this new trailer, I am no less skeptical of this game. None of this makes sense. You don't go from making practically nothing to making this. Something here doesn't add up, and I'm going to be watching very closely to see how this one lands. Speaking of open world zombie games, Dying Light 2's developer Techland revealed that they're working on a next gen update for Dying Light 1. They didn't provide any details on that, but I'm sure we can expect stuff like 4K, 60 FPS, yada yada. Despite being a little long in the tooth now, the title is still very much loved by its fans, so they were pretty happy to hear this. Before Genshin Impact, Mihoyo had Honkai Impact 3rd, playable on mobile platforms and PC through a dedicated download client. This week, they announced that the title is coming to Steam sometime in October, so if you'd like Gaben to take a cut of those sweet gacha dollars, now you can make that happen. The Pride of New Zealand made a big announcement this week. No, the other Pride of New Zealand, Grinding Gear Games. Their upcoming seasonal update titled Scourge is releasing on October 22nd. Of course, it's free because it's Path of Exile, and it's got a flashy new trailer that made Path of Exile fans very happy. I'm still holding off on this one as I'm waiting for Path of Exile 2 to arrive, or whatever they end up calling it. I am very looking forward to that though, because Path of Exile is much loved and I definitely want in on that. Circling back to that Animal Crossing DLC I mentioned earlier, that's a chunky one. The update is called Happy Home Paradise, and as the name would suggest, it's focused on interior decoration, setting you the task of designing homes to match certain themes. There's also the ability to create things like hospitals and schools, so you can become a benevolent dictator, controlling access to the social services of your island while underwritten by that devious capitalist, Tom Nook. Hmm, I think I played too much Far Cry 6 lately. Anyway, the expansion is paid, or you get it included in the oh-so-generously-priced Nintendo Online Upgrade Pack, and it's out on November 5th. Final announcement for the week was the reveal of Battlefield 2042's Hazard Zone game mode. Long kept under wraps, the curtain was pulled back to reveal something quite similar to Escape from Tarkov or Hunt Showdown. Squads of four are tasked with extracting fallen satellites, and while there's certainly an option to kill other players, you don't need to in order to be successful. This is a game style that has long been quite niche next to the juggernaut that is Battle Royale, so it'll be interesting to see if DICE's take on the formula is the one to really break through. 
The mode will be out when Battlefield 2042 ships on November 12th. Two delay announcements this week. First one is the shockingly beautiful Solar Ash, which has already suffered a few delays, but copped another one this week when the title was pushed back to December 2nd. Very much looking forward to this one. Well, you knew this story was coming, but that doesn't lessen the blow. Elden Ring has been officially delayed from its end of Jan release to February 25th. The news was met with a collective no across social media for many reasons. Number one, having to wait longer to play the next FromSoft opus is objectively a bad thing because we'd rather be playing it right now. Secondly, this new date is in February, a month that already has Horizon Forbidden West, the Saints Row reboot, martial arts fighter Sifu, and most alarmingly of all, Destiny 2's Witch Queen expansion, which launches just three days before Elden Ring's new date. I cannot believe that Miyazaki-san is making me choose between Elden Ring and Destiny 2. It is the dark souls of decisions and I really wish this one had an easy mode. To cheer us up a little, From did announce that they would be hosting a technical test for Elden Ring from November 12th to 14th, exclusive to Xbox and PlayStation consoles. You can sign up for that test on Elden Ring's website. And the other delay this week might just hold the record for the fastest delay announcement of all time. Last week, Ubisoft popped the cap off the top of Ghost Recon Frontline, and the stench that wafted out of the tin was so severe that it made even Ubisoft's management flinch. And do you know how smelly some of that French cheese is. The title was meant to go into an invite-only closed beta immediately after its reveal, but the backlash to the announcement was so total that Ubisoft announced that they were delaying the beta. I mean, for real, it was like four days between the announcement that the game exists and an announcement that the game was getting delayed. And if that isn't all you need to know about Ghost Recon Frontline, then I don't know what is. So what came out last week? Well, there was a bunch of re-releases and ports and stuff we'd already talked about and an NHL game, which no one cares about. So the only thing worth circling back on is the Rift Breaker. This one released on PS5, Xbox and PC, and it's also launched straight into Game Pass. Critic reviews for this one are very hard to find, but the ones that are out there are very positive, like God is a Geek, who scored it an 80, saying, quote, the Rift Breaker is a genuine challenge throughout, the world is beautiful and the campaign is superb, end quote. Steam reviews are where it's at. The game is sitting at 91% very positive, with over 2,000 votes in. That is huge. That makes it one of the most successful Steam releases of 2021 from a review perspective. This is a title from a small team who obviously worked their asses off to make something great, so congrats to them. Do yourself a favor and go check it out on Game Pass or buy a copy. It's cheap. It's like 40 Australian dollars or something. That's a bargain. So what's coming out this week? Well, that snazzy, creepy deck builder roguelike horror game I profiled last week arrives on Steam today. Inscription is all the rage behind the scenes with plenty of positive buzz from those who checked out the demo that's currently available. Obviously, this is a niche sort of title, but if it's your jam, it's very likely that Inscription is going to be extremely your jam. Into the Pit is a retro-inspired first-person roguelike that asks, what if Hexen had colors other than brown? You streak around levels spraying fireworks out of your hands like Jubilee, only hopefully more useful. God, she was such a shitty X-Man, wasn't she? Anyway, there's a demo up for Into the Pit right now, so you can try it before you buy, and the game releases today, exclusive to PC and Xbox for now. Dying Light Platinum Edition arrives today for the Nintendo Switch, while Dying Light 2 on the Switch will be cloud-streamed. This one exists on your local hardware. Interestingly enough, Digital Foundry just released an analysis of the port performance, and they had very good things to say about it. Surprising, given the fact that no one had high hopes for how this would run on the Switch, but developer Techland seemed to have pulled it off. Kudos to them. The Dark Pictures anthology House of Ashes hits all platforms but the Switch on October 21st. This is the third game in the series that aims to deliver standalone horror adventures under a unifying label. Feedback on the previous two entries was mixed to favorable, which isn't uncommon for horror games given that they're very often acquired tastes. Speaking of horror, Resident Evil 4 VR arrives exclusively for Oculus Quest 2 on the 21st. This is the seminal survival horror masterpiece made even more horrific by one tiny change. You need to create a Facebook account in order to play it. It continues to suck the big one that the best VR platform on the market is held hostage by the worst social media platform in existence, but them's the breaks, I guess. Put this on your radar. Huh? Yes, sir? I'm all right. And I'm almost there. Perhaps it's the last moment to go back. And do what? As far as I remember, we've run out of options here. 
This is The Invincible. And no, it is not based upon that recent animated show thing, which is super awesome, by the way. This is a sci-fi narrative-led thriller from newly formed studio Starwood Industries. There's a few things that are really interesting about this one. First up, it's based on the classic 1964 sci-fi novel The Invincible by Polish author Stanislaw Lem. Polish-based studio Starwood Industries have more than little experience in adapting Polish fiction into video game form, because many of the staff are former CD Projekt Red employees, and since it works so well on The Witcher, why not give it another go here? This is their debut title and it's already looking very impressive with some timeless retro futurist stylings, some impressive voice work and a narrative flair that comes with the territory when you're adapting a piece of classic fiction. The trailer is just a teaser, but Starwood are promising a branching storyline with many potential endings based on your choices. This looks like it'll be worth keeping an eye on. It's a new studio, so wish lists are worth their weight in gold for these guys. I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Sort of free stuff time and it's one of the quietest weeks on record and what there is isn't even that great. Epic's weekly offering continues to be less impressive than we've come to expect, though let's not be too entitled. They do give us awesome free shit on the reg, so we shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. This week you can still grab those four free Paladin heroes if you haven't yet, or if you're still playing Paladins, or if you've ever played Paladins, which you probably haven't. You can also grab Stubbs the Zombie, Rebel Without a Pulse at the moment, but come the 22nd that'll tick over to Among the Sleep Enhanced Edition. Now I hadn't heard about this one before, so I had to look it up. Apparently it's a first person horror game where you play as a child trapped in a nightmare and you have to go and find your mum. Or your mom, as Americans say it, but I'm not saying that. It's your mum, okay? Even if it sounds offensive when you say it that way. The Enhanced Edition was released back in 2017 and is sitting at 87% very positive on Steam with over 4,000 reviews in, so it's probably pretty good. The only other piece of sort of free stuff news we got this week was that Minecraft is finally coming to Game Pass on PC. Minecraft. Pretty much the highest selling game of all time. You've probably already bought like six copies of it on different platforms and it was already on Game Pass on Xbox consoles and come November, it will be on Game Pass for PC as well. Finally, our feel good story for the week is just one of the coolest fucking things I've ever seen. Next year, Mortal Kombat will turn 30 years old and as someone that remembered when the title first came out, I genuinely don't want to think about that fact. This week, Mortal Kombat co-creator Ed Boon took to Twitter to reveal a never before seen video from the archives. The moment when Scorpion's iconic get over here move was born. They were just doing some animation capture when Boone all of a sudden says, you know what would be a cool ass move? And you can watch as these dudes stand there and they just invent Scorpion's greatest move right then and there. They tweak it as they go, ensuring that the movement was quick enough to fit into a few frames and also finishes at shoulder height so that an opponent can duck underneath it. They finish things up with the tugging back animation to complete a move that would go on to be recreated in dozens of games, comics, animations and movies in the 30 years since. Okay, one more time. Win. I just love this stuff. Video games are such a young art form and it's so amazing to see its history play out right before our eyes. That's what this week in video games is, ladies and gentlemen. The first rough draft of history. Wow, that's the Washington Post line. We've really come full circle in this video, haven't we? What a finish, and you guys made it to the end. Give yourself a round of applause. Before you go, I would love it, love it, love it if you could just take a split second out of your day to hit that like button because that is worth its weight in gold around here. If you're new to these parts, you can also click the subscribe button since we've got plenty of good stuff coming up soon. Not so much this week, but next week is nuts. Trust me on that. Ding the notification bell if you'd like to be notified when all those juicy videos go live. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.